let's talk a little bit about Pokeswap now. Um, so Pokeswap is, uh, as I, I already showed how it fits into the whole ecosystem, but I haven't really talked about some of the features uh, other than the uh, token bonding proof, but there's a lot of cool stuff there. Um, also, it's, it's funded by grant from Web3 uh, that we got to start development uh, about a year ago. So Pokeswap is a automatic market making constant product decks, uh, similar to Uniswap with some really cool tokenomics built in uh, related to the Sora ecosystem and bridges to many other platforms. Um, so traditional DEXs, as you may have known, if you've used Uniswap or Sushi or whatever, um, they, well, maybe not so much as Sushi because it's pretty cheap, but still transactions fail a lot for me there. Um, they have unpredictable and high gas fees and they're susceptible to network congestion. So you do have uh, a lot of problems um, making transactions predictably uh, on Ethereum. Uh, current DEXs also have a lot of liquidity fragmentation. So um, for example, Uniswap version two, uh, it kind of emphasizes uh, ease of uh, creating token pairs, but it comes at the expense of, of the liquidity being very fragmented. So you can create any, uh, any token pairs you want uh, without going through like a hub token, but actually going through like a hub token makes token uh, trade routing much more efficient and you can get better price quotes. And also you don't, um, you don't have as, much prob as many problems with uh, having liquidity fragmented in many different token pairs. So, um, so, so that's one of the, the main issues with the liquidity on DEXs right now. Um, also, uh, Dex, current DEX design uh, really causes a lot of impermanent loss for liquidity providers. Um, and if combine that with, you know, high gas fees and it, it's really hard to like rebalance the portfolio and you do get uh, exposed to quite a lot of impermanent loss um, in, in current DEX designs. So to create a better DEX uh, in Pokeswap, we've done quite a lot of work um, on making um, and fixing these problems. So one, we use a uh, parity substrate uh, as the blockchain basis. And so transactions are much faster and much cheaper. So, um, I mean, I'll, I'll show you in, in, in a few minutes, like I'll just show you the, the product and you can, you can see how it is. It's very different from Ethereum. Um, and uh, we can even like combine liquidity uh, from multiple uh, exchanges using uh, aggregate liquidity technology. So we're working on uh, developing this, but the idea basically is that you can uh, get price quotes from many different liquidity sources and execute uh, against them. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we've also done a lot of innovation with the tokenomics of Zor and PSwap tokens uh, that I'll go into in a second. Um, a, a couple more things about the PSwap token. Um, it's a buyback and burn deflationary token. So every uh, transaction fee, the 0.3% swap of each, um, each swap on the decks goes to buy back uh, PSwap tokens and then burn these. And then every day, uh, these tokens are reminted and given to liquidity providers. So, um, but it's done in such a way that the reward, the percent of the re reburn, or sorry, the remint of the tokens um, goes down as a percentage of the, uh, the burned amount every day. So at, the, at day one, it's like 90% because the parliament gets 10%. Um, of the remit, um, but then it goes down to 35% um, after like four years. <clears throat> so, so what that means is that the token supply will be much more deflationary uh, in the future. Um, one other thing I'll just point out is you see this purple triangle, the strategic bonuses. These are strategic bonuses to, um, to incentivize people to do things like I, I explained already, like buying Zor from the token bonding curve uh, and giving collateral. Uh, there's two other ways to earn PSWAP as part of a strategic bonus. Uh, one is to provide liquidity on, uh, on the DEX. Like all liquidity providers will get a special bonus um, uh, for the first uh, four years, I think. Uh, so there's some, Above and beyond uh, transaction fees uh, that you get, there's also um, like PSWAP bonuses for uh, providing liquidity. Um, and, uh, and then finally, for market makers who execute um, a sufficient number of uh, volume per month, there's uh, trading rebates uh, from a rebate pool. <clears throat> but if you take these rewards and you just dump them on the market, giving them to the people who do these things, um, 
the, the price would just crash because you have unpredictable quantity. And as we, as I already explained, you know, it's the quantity of tokens in an economy that really determines a lot of things because markets are not in equilibrium. So, um, so what this means is that you don't want to just uh, dump it on the economy, you have to vest it over time. And the only rational way to vest it in a predictable way uh, to maintain the quantity is is as a percent of the burn. So that's what this purple triangle is. It's it's the amount of the daily burned that is reminted uh, as a, invested uh, for these uh, strategic rewards. It's a little complex, but but it's okay. Um, so there's a lot of potential to growth. Um, I, I love this slide. Um, <laughs> there's not too much substance, but it's cool. Um, I uh, already talked about some of these things. I think some of the tokenomics are important to kind of dive into a little bit. So um, what we do is we use Zor as a liquidity token pair. So when you provide liquidity on the DEX, you always have to do it with the Zor pair, um, which I'll show you in the demo. Uh, and this is, you know, it's a little bit of controversial opinion or a, a design decision because um, you know, Zor is not like a top 10 crypto yet, um, <laughs> yet. <laughs> um, and uh, so it, 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 it's a little bit of a niche token, but because it's managed by the token bonding curve, you do get, uh, you know, infinite amounts of liquidity if you wanted it. And so uh, it's really not a problem. You can always inject uh, more tokens into the environment as needed. Um, and uh, because it's managed also by token bonding curves, XOR token is more, uh, it, it has a little bit of you know, volatility dampening built in. Uh, and so this does help reduce impermanent loss uh, in our simulations. Um, we can do some cool things also with liquidity leveraging because uh, Zor is an ecosystem token. So through governance, you know, we can create new applications that can, can mint. Uh, Zor. So the idea is that uh, in the future we'll use um, use liquidity that's locked in liquidity pools as collateral to mint new Zor, and then that gives you instant liquidity. Like if you if you if you need to buy a pizza and you don't want to remove liquidity, you can just you know take out a loan against your liquidity pool. That's basically how it works. Um, yeah, I think uh, also another thing, using peace swap tokens as a reward instead of just giving uh, liquidity providers a larger share of their liquidity pools, uh, it gives you a different asset that has a different uh, like risk uh, profile. So that it reduces correlated risk. Um, so if you provide, let's let's say Zor or ETH, um, and both Zor and ETH, you know, go up in value or they go down in value. Like you're exposed to to these, um, you know, the, the fluctuations in these assets. But if you are rewarded in PSwap tokens, it's a different asset, and so you, you it does uh, change the risk profile uh, in a positive way. I would I think. Um, and I talked about the token bonding curve, and we have cool team. Um, so let's show a demo. Um, so. Let's see, I'm trying to think if I want to, <laughs> to demo this um, on uh, the dev stand or the test network. Uh, give me a second here and I will prepare the environment. I don't want to give away all my things here. So, so I'm gonna live a little risky and uh, show off the, the dev environment because it has some cool features um but it may uh it may not work because i i mean i don't i don't know if it's being updated or not uh, behind the scenes because it, it can be updated at any time because it's a dev environment um anyway let's go to the account screen so these are my assets uh, these are all all fake this is a test account i created just for testing don't steal my tokens um uh, so i've got different tokens um you can you can actually actually anyone <laughs> can create their own token uh, here maybe you create like a Sydney coin uh, Sydney coin maybe I don't know thirteen thirty seven um, so you can create your own token uh, it creates doo -doo -doo -doo. No, I can't type at all okay so uh, I'm creating my own token right now transaction submitted um, and I should see it come soon. 
it, it takes about six seconds. I don't know if I have to add it or not. Yeah, people having fun with the, the names on this test environment, I see. Um, oh, gee, I've got lots of tokens here. Oh my gosh. Yeah, there's like a side coin. Um, yeah, anyway, um, <laughs> where was the Sydney coins? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it is a test environment, so it is possible that, um, uh, but it looks like it's registered. Here, I'll go back. Let's search for Sid. There we are. So you have to add it. Okay. <clears throat> so I've got, I should have some Sydney coins there at the bottom. See? So let's, uh, let's create a liquidity uh, pool for this coin. So go here, type in Sydney. Um, I'm going to put like 10, I'll put 110 uh, as the initial price. So when you provide liquidity, you have to provide liquidity on both sides of the price point. And if you're creating a pair, you decide what the exchange rate is. So you could even have like um, Sydney coin be really valuable, or you can have it be like really not valuable. Um, and uh, yeah, so you hit supply. And, and another thing, you have to always do it with uh, respect to Zor. So you can't, um, you can't do like Sydney coin in like Ethereum or something um, because because it's poker swap and it's built on the Zor networks, so everything has to be uh, on uh, on Zor. Here we go, Zor sit. And then once you have uh, once you have your token pool, you can actually trade them. So, like, um, let's say I want more Sydney coins. I, I don't know why because I already have the pool. But uh, let's uh, hit swap and then uh, sign my transaction. By the way, all the transactions are using uh, this kind of ugly interface is uh, polka.js. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of like the MetaMask for the um, polka.ecosystem. ecosystem. Um, and it's, it's really great that they, um, that they hire blind designers to, to provide work for them. Anyway, I'm joking. Um, but uh, so you can, also, um, you can also go between like PSwap and Sydney coins because uh, the routing goes through Zor. So you don't have to go directly to Zor. You can just type in like Sydney, you can do like 1.27 and then swap and then you can do it. So it's, uh, it's pretty fast, pretty cheap. I don't know if you saw the transaction fee. The transaction fee is 0 0.0007 Zor. Um, I think that's final for the production network. Um, this is very, very close to what we'll have in production, by the way. Um, there's couple bugs that are just being fixed, but once these are done um, and it passes QA, then we're going to launch. So really, really close. Um, we also have a bridge. So that's one of the cool things about the bridge. Um, like, like I can move uh, assets that are registered on the bridge from the SOAR network to the Ethereum network. Uh, the testnet uses RinkB, by, by the way, and um, there's two Zors. So uh, the dev stand Zor is this one. So I've got 11 Zor now. And if I, um, I can move like 2.1337. So I can hit next and then hit confirm. And then uh, it asked you first to sign the transaction on the Zor network. And once it's confirmed on the Zor network, uh, then you'll be asked to um, to submit the cryptographic proof into Ethereum. So you have to sign another transaction for the Ethereum network. So with the Ethereum gas fees, it's not super cheap, but, um, but that's life. And um, <laughs> I think uh, when we, we can also deploy this to other EVM based networks that are a little bit cheaper. So right now it's generating the cryptographic proof um, of my SOAR network transactions. So, it waits for grandpa finality so after three blocks and then uh, then just hit sign here. And then um, Rink B network is uh, it's processing my transaction and it should be about 10 seconds or so. Good old Ethereum, there we go. See, it's, uh, it's finalized now. So if I go down here, you should see it's actually 13.1337, oh, anyway, but it's okay. Um, so uh, it's, yeah, so it, it works. That's how the bridge works. Um, you can do the opposite way. Uh, you can move like, let's say some, 
some val from ring b to i don't have any balance um okay uh, i can move like zor from ethereum to zor network and it's just the opposite um you first sign the transaction uh, on ethereum it gets uh finalized well there's no finalization in ethereum it gets put into a block and then you uh you send this cryptographic proof on the SOAR network and it gets processed. Um, one thing to note is that when you are, um, when you're sending the transaction on the SOAR network, it's going to take like uh, six, seven minutes because um, it's, it's waiting for 30 blocks because Ethereum has probabilistic finality because of mining. Um, so you can actually have uh, some, you know, uncooled blocks or you know some soft forks inside the network that would um, cause problems with the bridge so you have to wait uh, 30 blocks um, and depending on network conditions you might have to wait more gee so that's um that's a major functionality um i'll just say a couple other things um we've had a sore farm game uh on the test network um not test network what am i saying so on the <clears throat> on the current ethereum based uh, network we have a website store.farm where people are farming piece swap tokens they provide liquidity and you get these little squares um anyway it's a very simple game but we're hoping to uh uh to extend this uh in the future for the uh production launch so fearless is a really sexy and awesome wallet um for the polka dot ecosystem so in the polka dot ecosystem uh there's actually no native apps except for Fearless. So Fearless is the only uh, native mobile app, which means that it's programmed in uh, you know, native uh, Java or Kotlin for Android and uh, Swift for iOS. Um, the advantage of doing this is you do get um, uh, much better performance and you can really fine tune uh, and optimize everything. So, uh, we're working on some cool features like staking and in a few weeks this will be available and you can use it for managing your polkadot and kusama uh, staking and reward payouts if you use polkadot.js now um, it's kind of painful right because you if you click on like the payouts tab and you choose like six days or, or, or if you, it takes like a minute or two to load and if you choose 18 days your browser crashes <laughs> uh because of too much memory but in a fearless wallet it'll take like one or two two seconds um so it's going to be amazing um and really cool um so you can also purchase crypto and fearless and it's all open source so uh feel free to you know check out uh the github uh repositories and uh you know do do whatever you want um and stay fearless so um so <laughs> sure your brains are all full with different things um i'm happy to answer some questions now I was wondering, I'm probably going to be the only person in this room who misses the good old uh, Ether Delta. But uh, <laughs> I, I was wondering, like, since uh, sandwich uh, flash bots are a big issue for AMMs, uh, is there going to be a possibility to do a limit order on this? Ah, OK. Yeah, it's a very good question. So um, for limit orders <laughs> and having like an order book, um, we would represent this as a different liquidity source and it would be uh, used in the order routing algorithm to provide uh, basically to fill uh, part of an order. Um, this will be done in the future, but not um, not anytime soon because it's it complicates things quite a lot. Um, we prevent front running a little bit more than Ethereum because um, we, we have a flat transaction fee uh, for all the types of transactions. So um, you can't get any validator preference by giving a higher fee. Um, obviously, if you're an evil validator, you could, uh, you know, and, and you had enough nodes on the net network, maybe you could, uh, in some situations, uh, prioritize your own transactions and blocks, but that's, that's really hard to do, actually. Um, it's not really practical, I think. So, so front running is, is not as big an issue um, as you would have in Ethereum. Uh, but yeah, bots uh, trading um, still an issue. Um, I don't think there's any way to really get around that. And I'm not sure it's always a bad uh, thing either because you can kind of have um, uh, you know, more efficient markets if you do have arbitrage between many different uh, exchanges. No, thank you very much. 
Uh, anyway, yeah, no uh, rush to do it because uh, Uniswap V3 is, they're not, not even mentioning that in their uh, documentation for the V3. So I think it's not a popular decision to implement Uniswap. I'm yeah, the cool, it, it, to me, like the really cool thing about V3, well, Uniswap V3 is really they kind of um, use a slightly different curve, right? Um, so you, you can optimize the, the curve and the method you're using to be um, a little bit more capital efficient. Um, so uh, we're looking, yeah. we're looking at ways to do this in the future. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like I mean, there's, there's trade-offs for that, of course. Another question I have uh, is, um, so from my liquidity provider perspective, if I, uh, so let's imagine a classic AMM like Sushi. Let's imagine a classic AMM uh, like Sushi or uh, Uniswap, uh, one uh, If I put uh, my two assets, um, now, um, the permanent loss on this standard, I would have uh, exposure to asset one uh, dollar value, asset two dollar value. Uh, and I'm going to be rewarded for taking this free risk. So, a permanent loss, uh, asset one dropping in US dollar value, asset two dropping in uh, US dollar value. Uh, my understanding uh, is that uh, in uh, podcast swap, uh, as a liquidity provider, I'm going to be rewarded not by an increase of my liquidity tokens, but uh, uh, with these uh, solar tokens. Uh, do I understand correctly? Is that the case? Um, yeah, when you provide liquidity, it always has to be with respect to XOR. Um, so, like, you know, token X versus XOR, token Y versus XOR. So it makes XOR hub token uh, that all the other tokens are kind of connected to. Um, if you're trading, uh, you don't really have to do that. Um, I mean, you can to, you can go from X to token Y and behind the scenes, yeah. it, will, it will automatically route. Um, there's lots of good reasons to do this. I talked about how it can help reduce IL or impermanent loss a little bit because uh, Zor is a little bit more stable. It's not a stable coin, but it is kind of predictable, right? Forward guided. The question yeah, is yeah, basically, can... with normal liquidity provision, I have three risks. So I have asset number one going down in US dollar value, asset number two going down in uh, US dollar value, and in permanent loss. Uh, now, with this, uh, though, the reward that I get, differently from other AMMs, is not in the increase of my liquidity tokens, but uh, in um, this XOR, which is being given to me. Now, if this XOR was a stable coin, I would say, well, fair enough, it's pretty much the same, but it's gonna be a, a volatile asset. So am I not exposing myself to an extra layer of uh, unpredictability as a liquidity provider? Yes, that's my question. You are. So yes, okay, fair enough. I, I understand the question. So the, um, uh, to be clear, the liquidity providers are not getting XOR, they're getting PSWAP tokens. And PSWAP is a deflationary token. So what that means is the, um, the supply is going down over time, which, uh, which means there's less tokens on the market over time, which means that from a long-term perspective, uh, you would expect maybe some, uh, you know, some longer-term uh, you know, price uh, increase, which would be uh, one way to offset some of the IL. Um, so that's the... Uh, I think that's the, one of the key points that I think was a, maybe is easy to misunderstand. So XOR is the native network token, but the actual reward for the LPs, uh, the liquidity providers, is uh, in PSWAP. So it's a different uh, it's a different token. So the segregation of the different tokens um, allows you to kind of fine tune uh, the tokenomics for the different use cases. All right. Thanks. So the, the answer is basically yes, uh, but uh, there's a deflationary component in the top, so we might not expect like big uh, depreciation. So this is entirely fine. Thanks. That's interesting. So uh, the fees are uh, going to be 0 0.3, same as Uniswap, right? Yeah. So it's it's pretty high fees, but that's um, I think that's the, the only way to, to incentivize uh, liquidity providers. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you very much. So, uh, yeah, I've um, got some uh, thoughts based on some notes I've been taking uh, as you went through, and I think I'd uh, like to address the question of the uh, the complexity of the um, the Sora ecosystem and the, the monetary system and all the governance layers 
there's there's a huge uh, education and learning curve for people uh, to acclimatize and understand how to engage with this kind of uh, system that you've designed. Um, do you have any thoughts about how uh, people, where do you suggest people should begin their uh, monetary theory and practical outcome learning journey? Oh, geez. So um, I think like most things, people don't really have to understand it uh, to use it. I think it can just be kind of, um, the best things should be designed so well that people don't even have to know the mechanics. For people who are interested in the details, um, yeah, it's quite a journey. I mean, I was a computer scientist by training and then um, I uh, just through crypto, I started to question like, you know, what is money? What, and then from that kind of get into like different economic theories. And really it was, um, uh, I mean, not just the work of Professor Werner, but also uh, many uh, economists before him uh, that that really were quite interesting. And, and Professor Werner's work resonated with me a lot because um, I moved to Japan and became a Japanese citizen. And um, it, it's really very deeply tied to the story of Japan uh, because you know Japan went from being devastated in the war to having nothing. And then at, at the peak, it was uh, you know almost, uh, almost the world's highest economy or biggest economy, um, <laughs> even though it's a very small place, right? So it, um, when I moved to Japan, actually Japan was second largest economy and then uh, now it's third, but um, it, it, it's because of the way the money was created and allocated for production. So really it was, uh, I think it was, you know, only Werner who really studied that and, and got down into the details, but, but obviously these theories are not that, um, that new. Uh, a lot of this work goes back quite a ways. So uh, I like the work of uh, a Fisher. Um, so he, he's the one who came yes. up with the equation of exchange, um, which it's a very simple equality, but uh, it, it, it generally holds up very well. And, um, and at the macro level, uh, the work of Werner makes a lot of sense. If you go into the micro level, you get lost in, in many ways, which I think is um, maybe not uh, the best. So, so, so to me, microeconomics is not as interesting as uh, macroeconomics. So, yes. so, so if you really want to study it, uh, the short answer is, you know, you should read uh, probably Professor Werner's book, uh, New Paradigm in Macroeconomics. Um, it's, uh, it's more like a textbook um, and it's very, you know, well cited and very interesting. Um, and, yes, and then, I was just wondering whether that, yeah. that was part of the, um, the journey you had in mind for people starting to use um, you know, fearless to begin with, where you'll have a, a link to any information about Sora more broadly, how it works, and then take people through a process of learning about the, um, the governance and the parliament and the uh, committees, like let people choose a journey for themselves. Is that part of the I think the part of the Part of the hard thing is that a lot of this is not uh, like the parliament and stuff is not operational yet, so it takes takes some time to get things uh, ready. And it, I think once these are um, operational, it'll be much easier to understand. But people okay. can already get involved. They can go to our Telegram chats, uh, and uh, you know we can put some memes there together. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah, um, sure. so <laughs> I remember joining your group about two or three years ago. I haven't been active for a long time, but I was excited early on with what you were doing when you were first working with Hyperledger and uh, some of the, the things you were doing there. So I kept an eye on it over time. We, we've got more questions. We've got another a guest here with a question. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, so he listens there. Oh, okay. Uh, so there's um, I apologize if my question is not very technical, but um, I'd love to hear just a bit, um, sort of, it's sort of a three-parter that I think you can answer in one, which is kind of, uh, how did you get involved in this space with Polkadot in particular? What was that dating process like? You know, what, what, how did you get involved in Uniswap? Uh, sorry, in Polkaswap uh, to begin with. Um, how do you see your moat in this space, uh, specifically around, you know, being sushi? Um, and then lastly, if we wanted to bootstrap ourselves to the success of you and your team out of the different tokens you talked about tonight, where should we really be looking? Is it Zora, is it PSWAP, et cetera? Thank you so much. Wow, there's, there's a lot of things there. So um, 
I mean, so as far as how I got involved in all this stuff, um, I, I got, I mean, it was January of 2013 that I got into crypto through like Bitcoin. And that was really just um, uh, like the beginning of a journey, really. So that was <laughs> a journey that went through many, many phases. Um, I, uh, I did, you know, was involved in other altcoin projects. Um, I, you know, I founded Soramitsu five years ago, so we're celebrating our fifth year now. Uh, and we've done quite a lot of things. So we, you know, we built, um, you know, the payment system for Central Bank of Cambodia using uh, Hyperledger Iroha, which we also built. And so we've done, we've done a lot. Um, and we, and, and we keep building and developing our own technology uh, quite a lot as well. Um, for economics, it was really, um, yeah, kind of Bitcoin and, and crypto in general uh, really made me question a lot about money and what it is. And, and, and through that, I kind of came across many different theories of uh, economics, um, some of which I think are... Economics is really frustrating because uh, it's almost like religions, right? So um, there's many different ideas and everyone thinks they're right. and um, and they're, and they're all right in, in different ways, right? And that's kind of the frustrating thing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's so you, you have to figure out, you know, you know take your own bits and pieces that, uh, that lift you up and that can, can improve you, just, just like with <laughs> religions, actually. So it's kind of, money, money is a really weird thing. And um, we don't, you know, learn about it in school or, you know, no one really explains what it is or how it came to be or... You know anything so it's a little bit um a little bit frustrating frustrating from that sense so you really do have to go on a personal journey and figure that out and that's you know taken me from when i started this you know since 2013 until now and it's always um moving on my company you know we we do a lot of technology provision and talking uh well polka dot gee so the journey i don't know i got I first met Gavin Wood back in 2014 when he came uh, to Japan. Uh, we actually met in uh, Kyoto after he came down uh, from Tokyo and uh, he gave a talk about um, uh, Ethereum at the time. And then uh, uh, a few years later, you know, he left Ethereum and then um, I heard he's working on Polkadot. And so I was able to kind of find out more about uh, what, what he was working on. And uh, it's a very interesting ecosystem. I think it's, it's a, uh, um, the cool thing is that it, it 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 kind of goes along with my philosophy in that it it kind of goes against blockchain maximalism. So the idea that you can have many different systems coexisting, you don't have to just have one true blockchain. <laughs> um, and so everyone can be their own king, have their own kingdom, uh, but you can interoperate, and that's really um, one of the really amazing and cool things about Polkadot. And um, and sure, that already exists in things like Cosmos, but you know, let's not kid ourselves. Polkadot has really taken the technology a lot farther. Parity Substrate is a really powerful uh, platform for building blockchains, um, and uh, and this didn't exist before. So now suddenly we have really great tools and technology to to build new things. So through this journey, um, we yeah, I mean, talking to the community, there's like an obvious need for like a Dex and uh, and you know. PokeSwap is kind of like the, the analog of Uniswap on Ethereum. And so it's kind of a, a place where everyone can kind of come together and uh, trade their assets. Um, and uh, parachains are still, you know, being developed, but they're really, really close. And um, I think it's going to be uh, some of the some of the features of parachains like Spree uh, should make it very nice to to do like direct um, swaps even across different uh, parachains. And so that's going to be really, really exciting. Um, but there's always new things. Obviously, it's not just us contributing. It's a, you know, there's a whole ecosystem. There's people like you here in Sydney who are, um, you know, studying about what we're doing and, and helping to, to, to learn more and to, to teach others. Um, and yeah, we're hoping other people can contribute uh, more to, to the source code and to help out and, and anyone is allowed to, to kind of be a part of this. So yeah, please, uh, 
don't be shy, please get involved. Uh, you can run a node. Uh, if you run a node and you have high availability, you can get people to nominate you and you can get rewards and DAO tokens. <laughs> so there's lots of there's lots of really good in incentives. Now, how do you how do we build up this ecosystem? I think is what you asked. And because there's all these different tokens, all this stuff. Um, I'll tell you what I see as a structural need. And that's really right at launch, we need to have really good uh, collateral uh, of the token bonding curve. So what that means is we need people to be willing to part with their ETH and their DAI uh, to, uh, to collateralize the token bonding curve so that the ecosystem has some value basis. Because without that, um, it kind of, it, I mean, it's, it's not going to break anything, but it's going to take a lot longer to bootstrap the, the value basis of, uh, of, of Zor. And I think the whole ecosystem kind of rides on, on that. Um, yeah, so that's some of my thoughts. <laughs> I guess the rest you can you can try to study more about the ecosystem and maybe you know, come to different conclusions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, any more questions, Bobby? Um, yeah, uh, just, just probably the last question. Probably uh, one or two more quickly. Uh, uh, you don't have to answer this, but you mentioned uh, yeah, other EVMs, potentially other bridges. Uh, are there any that you've got um, that people should keep an eye out for, like Near or um, BSC or Solana? And is Solana a friend or a foe or a frenemy? Or... <laughs> yeah, these are good questions. So, um, yeah, I mean, we're focused mainly on, uh, yeah, other large uh, EVM based blockchains. Um, I think. Any, any EVM-based blockchain we want to support. So in the future, we can support all of them. Uh, it'll just take a little bit longer. For Kusama and for Polkadot, uh, there's no pair chains yet. So we're working on bridges uh, directly to these relay chains so that we can move our tokens, um, uh, move, sorry, Kusama and DOT uh, tokens to our network. Um, I'm a little bit frustrated that we don't have this uh, at, at launch, but um, if anyone wants to help contribute to this, it would be very happy. As far as Solano, um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm familiar, of course, with the ecosystem. Uh, and I think it just take, takes time to build bridges because each one has to be tested. I think we're going to focus yeah. more on EVM-based projects uh, that are close to like the Polkadot ecosystem. And, and of course, uh, BSC, because uh, we're working with Tau Protocol. OK, well, that's good to know. Uh, and in terms of developers and interest, like in uh, support for developers, SDKs, or uh, uh, is there any uh, smart contract uh, uh, language or different from Solidity, or what, what's the the uh, possibilities for developers to, to start to look at what you're doing and, and build on top of the ecosystem? Yeah, so uh, the way you build on top of SOAR network is, um, so, uh, long in a, in a few months, probably we'll support uh, Parity Inc, which is a smart contract language. Um, it's a DSL and Rust. Uh, okay. We don't, we won't support Solidity. Solidity is is rubbish. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, in the short term, if you really wanted to program something today, uh, the way you would do this is using a substrate palette. So you create like a palette, and then um, this has to be yeah. deployed. This has to be deployed as a runtime upgrade. So you would create the palette, uh, you would make a pull request, the, the community would review it, you would uh, make a proposal for the runtime upgrade and the SORA uh, council, which is a council of 13 members, uh, that'll yep. vote. So this is very similar to the Kusama Polkadot councils. Um, this, cool. is, this is just to bootstrap the ecosystem in the future, this will be replaced by the SORA parliament. Um, so it's not very friendly, but um, it'll get easier. I mean, it's a new ecosystem. It's going to take, you know, years to develop. Yeah, and, and Clarity would be the other one I'd be interested in, if there's uh, anyone working to, to look at Clarity support. Uh, did you, you mean Parity Inc? Uh, Clarity. Oh, Clarity. What's what's Clarity? Oh, it's, a, it's another smart contract uh, language that's um, probably worth a look, actually. Oh, you mean in Substrate or? Uh, no, no, it's... um available for uh, block stack and also for conversion to uh, uh, solidity but it's it's actually a, a much cleaner smart oh, project okay. language, so. it's interesting yeah i think uh i i 
kind of like Parity Inc. Uh, it's kind of like more special. It's more specialized for this ecosystem, but um, it's it's much easier to write in uh, write to correct code uh, than in uh, Solidity. Yeah. Well, that's it from me. Unless there's okay. one final audience question, I think we're good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. We good. And uh, well, thank you very much for your time. Uh, we overdue a little bit. I mean, appreciating your time, and we're extremely. Uh, Thankful for your time and your excellent presentation. And yeah, yeah. thank you very much. More than 40 of us here tonight enjoyed that very much.